Make sure this season to check out Walter's self-pour beer wall, which includes 24 different items, including Fireside Chat, Vienna Lager, and Green City IPA. Visit waltersdc.com for more information. We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences, so the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. The kick in, the pitch, swing, a line drive, shallow right, a base hit. Charging up to get it, Rosario, runner breaking for the plate. The throw will be offline. Short hops the catcher. And into second base goes Miguel Rojas. Second of the game, drives it his fifth run of the year. The Dodgers have played it two here in the eighth. It's now Los Angeles three and Washington one. Matt Barnes, first base out of the rubber, delivers. Swing and a long drive, deep to right, way, way. The second level, a long home run for Shohei Otani. And the Dodgers now lead by the score of four to one. A splitter left up over the middle of the plate, 450 feet is the estimated distance of that one, crushed by Otani. Now the set of the pitch, swing a line drive up base hit into right field, rounding third Garcia being held up, but rounding second. Heading for third, Gallo. Now they throw home. Garcia's caught between third and home. Smith throws it to the third baseman, and they get the out. The tag by Muncy as the Nationals run themselves into the second out of the inning. And welcome to Nats Chat for Wednesday, April 24th, 2024, along with MassInSports.com Nationals insider Mark Zuckerman, who is at Nationals Park, I'm Al Galdi, host of the Al Galdi podcast. A Tuesday night, not a good night for Washington, D.C. teams against teams in blue. The Capitals lost at the New York Rangers 4-3 to go down 2-0 in that best of seven series in the first round of the Stanley Cup playoffs. And the Nationals lost to the Los Angeles Dodgers 4-1 at Nationals Park in game one of a three-game series. And that's for this regular season now are 10 and 12. The Nats had a shot. They walled down 4-1 in the bottom of the ninth, drew three walks and had a single all off Dodgers reliever Evan Phillips, uh, a native of Maryland, by the way. He was born in uh, Salisbury, Maryland, but Phillips was on the ropes. The Nats had the bases loaded with two outs and with one of the team's best hitters this season, Jesse Winker at the plate, but he struck out swinging to end the game, a game in which Patrick Corbin pitched well, but the Nats bullpen did not do well. A game in which Lane Thomas got hurt. A game in which the Nats made three big outs on the base paths. Mark, there was a lot to take in with this game. You know, Al, for a game that finished four to one and took three hours and 10 minutes, and you're asking how in the world did it take that long? I think it's because there was actually a lot that took place along the way, especially in the latter half of the game, once the bullpens were involved, and certainly once there were really some critical moments on the bases that Pretty much all of them went against the Nationals, and maybe the worst of them was Lane Thomas getting hurt on that. Yeah, and that was off a successful steal of second base. So even when the Nats did something well on the base pass in this game, something negative happened. So yeah, the uh, outs on the base pass. Luis Garcia Jr., he in this game as the Nats starting second baseman and number eight batter, one for three with a single and a walk. He, in that bottom of the ninth, drew a one-out walk, but he then was tagged out in a rundown 
between third base and home plate on a one-out single to right field by C.J. Abrams. It's a little confusing what exactly went wrong here, so we can get to that in just a moment. But I mentioned Abrams. Uh, He is an at-starting shortstop and number one batter. Did have another good game. Three for five, uh, three singles, but he got tagged out on the base pass. Abrams in the bottom of the seventh, a one-out infield single on a tapper to the right side of the infield, despite having been down at 1.02. But he then, seconds later, was picked off and tagged out in an attempted steal of second base. And then also Nick Senzel. He is an ad-starting designated hitter and number seven batter, 0 for 3 with a walk and two strikeouts. He in the bottom of the fourth drew a one-out walk, but he then was picked off and tagged out in an attempted steal of second base. It was interesting, though. Davey Martinez in his post-game press conference with you guys was not that upset about the outs on the base pass. He kind of shrugged them off. What'd you think about that? Yeah, I was a little surprised by that. His answer was essentially, look, everyone's been praising us for all the base running we're doing and the aggressiveness that we've had out there. And and that is true. He says sometimes it's going to come back to get you. We're going to be aggressive. We really are. I mean, people are praising us for the way we run the bases. That's just how we're going to play. You know, we just got to understand, you know, when, you know, when we're, when it's one nothing, we got to try to score. We got to try to get guys on second base scoring position. Okay. I can see that. But you know what? When you're playing the Dodgers and when you get the kind of pitching performance you got from Patrick Corbin in this one, boy, you better find a way to score just a couple of runs. And if that's the case, you cannot hurt yourself by running into outs. Pickoffs are never a good thing. I'm sorry. That's not being aggressive. That's not being smart. That's taking off before you know the pitcher is actually delivering the ball to the plate. So there's that. And then on the play in the ninth, he very strongly defended Ricky Gutierrez, his third base coach, put the blame really on Joey Gallo as the trailing runner on it. I think Gallo was definitely, there's a lot to blame on him for that, for not reading what was going on in front of him and then how he reacted to it. But watching from high above, to me, this all started with Gutierrez, who is waving Garcia around initially and then puts up an extremely late stop sign, basically right as Garcia reaches third base. Now, Garcia... I think did everything possible he could have. I don't think he did anything wrong under the circumstances. He slammed on the brakes as quickly as he could and would have probably been able to go back to third, if not for Gallo, not paying attention and already being almost all the way there. And that's how you end up in that rundown and truly a toot plan as it turned out. But number one blame for that one to me is Ricky Gutierrez. Number two blame is Joey Gallo. So I got to think that if you're a Nats fan and you're frustrated by the outs on the base pass these last few years, the way Davey talked about the outs on the base pass during the postgame presser has got to be a little frustrating because we've seen these things happen way too often. And there is a perception of Davey of he's not hard enough on these guys to where these things stop happening. And it's always tricky with that stuff, right? Because we're not privy to what's happening behind the scenes. So maybe Davey is hard on these guys behind the scenes, and we just don't see or hear about that. But when he and a postgame presser off a game that was winnable against a good team of the Dodgers, and the team commits three outs on the base pass, and he kind of shrugs them off, I don't like that. That does not sit well. To me, you as the manager of a growing team, you need to demand excellence. You know, you need to say, that's not good enough. We need to be better in that regard. And and I just, I wish you would have said that. I know Davey is is a nice guy and it's not in his nature to sound off in a post-game presser. And I'm not, I'm not asking him to sound off, but you know, would it be so bad if he said, yeah, you know, that's not good enough. We need to be better than that. I would have liked to have heard that from Davey. Yeah. And again, it's one thing if it's a case of, okay, guys, being overly aggressive, trying to go first to third when maybe he shouldn't have being thrown out or trying to steal a base and then getting thrown out on a bang, bang play at second. Okay. But we're talking about two guys picked off. Again, that's the read of the runner. Are you just watching the pitcher to make sure he goes to play? Now I know it was a lefty and it's a, always a tougher read, but if you aren't hundred percent sure, don't go, don't put yourself in that spot. So there's that. And then, like I said, the play in the ninth really and I get it. You're down three runs. It's kind of last ditch effort. Who knows what would have happened? But you gave yourself a chance in the ninth, and then you took one chance away by running into an out that didn't have to be run into when you're trailing by three runs at the time. So yeah, I, I think a little more public forcefulness would have been better. We don't know. There could have been a little more going on behind the scenes. I think there often is. I was disappointed too that he didn't at least raise the possibility that Gutierrez didn't handle it well. 
as a first year third base coach. I mean, he, he went out of his way to say, I really think he did a great job there. Well, I think you got to be careful not to come across like you're praising your coaches too much and then criticize players. I think it's okay to acknowledge like nobody's perfect out there to say, yeah, listen, it was a tough read. It was a, a late stop sign from Ricky. If he could have it back, he'd probably take it back. But, you know, that happened. Something like that, I think would have been appropriate. So we mentioned what happened with Lane Thomas, starting right fielder, number two batter, one for three with a single and a stolen base. But he left the game due to getting hurt. Thomas in the bottom of the fifth, a two-ounce single to left center field and a steal of second base. But he, on the steal, hurt his left leg, initially stayed in the game, but did end up leaving the game, was replaced by Eddie Rosario and Davey during uh, his postgame press conference on Tuesday night said that uh, Thomas was to undergo an MRI exam on his left knee, which uh, is a bit concerning. Right now, it's just a uh, left knee. He's going to get an MRI tomorrow. We don't know much else than that. He's pretty stiff. Yeah, it is. And if you saw the play, it was kind of cringeworthy when you saw the way it happened. Very innocent play, just a kind of flukish thing. He's sliding into second, stealing the base, and his left leg, the trailing leg, got twisted around. And he got up and he seemed initially okay. And then he fell down, clearly was like not wanting to put any weight on the leg. They rushed out to check on him. He got up, he shook it off. He said, I want to try to stay in. They let him jog around a little bit. And he looked okay. So you understand why you say, okay, if you think you can handle this, stay in the game. But that's one of those where you say to yourself, keep an eye on him. Chances are this is going to stiffen up as the game plays out. And sure enough, two innings later, he's out of there. Now, we don't know the severity of it. Like we said, getting an MRI on Wednesday morning. And even if it's not severe, they obviously have to have somebody come into town as a potential replacement in case he needs to go on the IL. And I think there's some very fascinating questions there about how they handle that situation because there are a few different options and they're at the complete opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of what it would mean short term versus long term. Is it James Wood time? You know, it was said during that nine-game trip in California, hey, they're out west. Now wouldn't be the ideal time to call up the Uber prospect in James Wood. Well, here we have the Nats now at home facing a marquee team in the Dodgers. James Wood is doing well. Would seem to make sense if Lane Thomas goes on the injured list to summon James Wood. I would say I think it depends on the severity of this and how long they think he could be out. This is a short-term thing. I could understand not necessarily making the move quite yet and bringing up someone like Alex Call, who I know is not going to get anybody excited, but has hit well here the last few days. That's a short-term fix. If it does look like it's going to be a more significant thing and he's going to be out for a longer period of time and you know, hey, we need a starting right fielder for the next you know month plus, then yeah, I do think it makes sense. Put the kid out there see how he does with it, and knowing that he's got some rope. You're not just saying, hey, you got 10 days to show us what you got, and then if it doesn't work out, you're out of here, or you could lose your job because the guy uh, who you replace is going to be healthy again, and he's the starter. So I think that's the calculation. Now, I don't know if they're going to know that early enough to make that decision. I don't know if they bring both guys in. I'm still trying to figure that out myself as we record this, but it does open the window of possibility there for a very big move for James Wood if it looks like Lane Thomas would have to miss any significant amount of time. I could understand why that would make sense to be the move. If it's not, I could see how they would say, let's just get a short-term fix in here. And remember, the James Wood move would require a 40-man roster move. So that's another layer to this. They already made one 40-man roster move to make a bullpen move earlier in the day. So there's only so many of those you can make. If you're going to do it, you got to know that he's going to be here for a while. Wood has cooled off a bit, but his OPS for AAA Rochester on the season still a uh, rather robust 892. Hey guys, Al Galdi for Window Nation. Are you frustrated by higher and higher heating and cooling bills? Have you finally had enough of the frigid drafts or moisture coming through your windows? Well, take a listen to the great offer of being extended by Window Nation to listeners of the Nats Chat Podcast. If your windows are cracked or leaking and or won't open or stay open, now is the time to call Window Nation, which is offering the following deal to listeners of the Nats Chat Podcast. Two free windows for every two windows that you buy, plus zero down, zero interest, and zero payments for 24 months. Call 866 866- 
90 Nation or visit windownation.com and make sure that you tell Window Nation that you want the deal that you heard about from Al Galdi on the Nats Chat Podcast. Upgrade the look, feel, and value of your home with great new Window Nation windows. Window Nation is the best and take advantage of the offer. Two free windows for every two windows that you buy plus zero down, zero interest, and zero payments for 24 months. 866-90NATION or windownation.com. That's 866-90NATION or windownation.com. And make sure that you tell Window Nation that you want the deal that you heard about from Al Galdi on the Nats Chat Podcast. Football season may be over, but the action on the floor is heating up. Whether it's tournament season or the fight for the playoff home court, there's no shortage of high-stakes basketball moments this time of year. Get in on the excitement with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app where you can turn your hoops knowledge into serious cash. You can now win up to 100 times your money on Prize Picks with as little as four correct picks. You can turn $10 into $1,000 with NBA, NHL, and college basketball entries today on Prize Picks. Prize Picks even offers injury insurance so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. So for basketball games, this means if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and doesn't return in the second, that player projection won't count against you and the rest of your entry stays live. Download the app today and use the code BLUEWIRE for a first deposit match up to $100. That code is BLUEWIRE for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize picks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Craig is usually a fan of water cooler talk, but it's draft season, and that's all anyone wants to talk about. The Athletic has loads of articles about this year's draft, but Greg doesn't have the Athletic, so now he's filling up his water bottle in the bathroom sink, which, to remind you, is the sink people use after they use the bathroom. Get the Athletic and get the info you need to speak draft fluently. Here's the set. He shows bunt, pushes it first base side. Vargas breaks for the plate. There'll be no play there. Throw to first. Just in time with Betts over to cover. And Jacob Young pointing toward the dugout say, hey, you should challenge that. He thought he beat the play at first. And the Nationals appear to, they're going to challenge this call at first base. What a perfect bunt in the safety squeeze situation against a left-handed pitcher. And I, I think Young's foot down is before Betts' foot is down. I think they're going to win this challenge. The call on the field's overturned. Runners safe. Washington We'll excuse Larry Vanover for his lack of enthusiasm in his well, announcements. He's the one who got overturned. It's a bunt single, and the Nationals lead one to nothing. This was an odd game for the Nats offensively on Tuesday evening. Just one run, just seven hits, six of which were singles, a double and six singles. And yet the Nats drew an outstanding eight walks. And the Nats went three for nine with runners in scoring position. Davey, during his postgame presser, talked about the Nats not hitting with runners in scoring position. Statistically speaking, they actually kind of did three for nine. Uh, And yet somehow the Nats scored just one run, which came on an RBI bunt single. Jacob Young as the Nats starting center fielder and number nine batter, one for three. The one was an RBI bunt single. A terrific bunt by Young. Now, he initially was ruled out, but Davey Martinez astutely and successfully challenged that play to get Young the single. Now, Young did have some defensive problems in this game. Top of the fifth, he committed a fielding error on a two-ounce single by Mookie Betts to right center field. Uh, Young bobbled uh, his handling of the baseball, allowing Betts to get to second base. And Young in the top of the sixth bobbled his handling of the baseball on a two-out RBI single by Kike Hernandez to center field to tie the game at one, although uh, Hernandez did not advance a base. And Young off initially being charged with a second error, ended up not being charged with a second error. But a weird game for the Nats offensively. And look, I guess part of that is you make three outs on the base pass, drawing eight walks, going three for nine with runners in scoring position can only produce one run. Right. The other problem is of those three hits, what were they? It was an infield single by Luis Garcia, the squeeze bunt single by Jacob Young, and then the Abrams single in the ninth that didn't score anybody because of the base running issue. Although if they all do it right, the bases are just loaded. They're not going to wave them around anyway. So none of those were exactly rousing hits that would score one or multiple runs. And that's where they were lacking, I think, uh, in a lot of ways. 
I do sense this recurring theme for them. Like offensively, they're giving themselves chances. They really are both with walks, with hits. I mean, they're, they're consistently giving themselves eight, nine, 10, 12 at bats with runners in scoring position during the course of a game. And they're converting sometimes, but it feels like they're always coming up one or two short, at least in the games that they lose. And it's a fine line. And they're really not that far away from having a winning record, to be honest, on the season. A couple more hits in the right moments, a couple more quality bullpen appearances. And I think we're talking a very different story right now than 10 and 12. So I kind of take that as an encouraging sign, but you would like to see some development there and start seeing a few more guys coming through in those spots when you do have a chance, not just to get one run home with a, a single, but to get a couple runs home with a double or a, you know, a, a, a single that scores two with the bases loaded, that kind of thing. So I think that's where they're lacking. But again, I like the fact that they have all these opportunities. That's good. They just need to start converting on them. The Nats are drawing more walks. That is a big-time improvement from what we've seen in recent seasons. The home run is still an issue, save for C.J. Abrams. The team just is not hitting many home runs. Joey Gallo has not gotten going in terms of hitting home runs, which is basically why he's here. And Gallo's not even an everyday player anymore. He's sort of in and out of the lineup these days. So you'd like to see more homers. But yes, the walks have been really encouraging. You mentioned the Nats bullpen. That was a problem for the Nats uh, in this 4-1 loss to the Dodgers on Tuesday evening. We've talked about this a lot. Davey Martinez has been using a lot of relievers. In part, yes, due to starting pitchers not lasting long in games, but I think a bigger reason is Nats relievers not being good enough to where they last for long in games. Davey on Tuesday evening used five Nats relievers. They combined to allow four runs in three and two-thirds innings. Derek Law, he allowed a run in a third of an inning. He, in the top of the six, faced four batters, but he got just one out. He gave up a two-out first pitch single by Teoscar Hernandez on a grounder into center field, issued a two-out five-pitch walk of Max Muncy, and then gave up a two-out RBI single by Kike Hernandez to center field to tie the game at one. Jordan Weems, Faced four batters, got three outs. Hunter Harvey officially allowed two runs in one inning. He faced six batters, but got just three outs, including giving up a one-out pinch RBI double by James Outman to right field for a 2-1 Dodgers lead in the top of the eighth, despite Harvey having had Outman down at 1.12. Now, this to me was a particularly interesting spot in the game. Outman is a lefty batter. He historically has struggled mightily against left-handed pitching, but the Nats now do not have a lefty in their bullpen. Why? Well, they on Tuesday afternoon announced having placed lefty reliever Robert Garcia on the 15-day injured list retroactive to April 21st due to influenza, which, as we know, has been making its way around the Nats. So the Nats, for now, do not have a lefty in their bullpen. They apparently don't have a lefty in the minors, who they felt comfortable calling up. So they instead called up Jacob Barnes. The Nats on Tuesday afternoon announced having selected his contract from AAA Rochester, and as a corresponding roster move, announced having designated infielder outfielder Jake Alou for assignment. Yes, Jake Alou got DFA'd on Tuesday. Jacob Barnes on Tuesday evening. Evening, Nats regular season debut officially tossed a third of a scoreless inning, but he faced two batters, got just one out. He to the first batter he faced, gave up a two out opposite field RBI single by the Dodgers number nine batter Miguel Rojas on a one two pitch for a three one Dodgers lead in the top of the eighth. And then another Barnes, Matt Barnes, he allowed a run in one inning. He in the top of the ninth gave up a leadoff homer by Shohei Otani on a moonshot to right field for a 4-1 Dodgers lead. This was a classic Showtime Shohei Otani homer, a projected 450 feet per stat cast. So a lot going on with the bullpen, but once again, Davey uses five relievers in a game. And keep in mind, the Nats do not have a scheduled off day until Monday, May 6th. That is a ways away I don't see how Davey can continue to use four or five relievers game after game. Yeah, I agree. And I think the issue, as you alluded to there, is that a lot of these guys who are coming in are not completing the inning they need to complete. And that sets in motion this chain of events where now you're asking for more out of others as well. If Derek Law, who comes in with one out, nobody on in the sixth in a one nothing game, he gets the first batter, he faces out. So it's two outs, nobody on. If he just gets out of the inning without a run scoring, 
everything sets up better. And now you go to Weems for the seventh, Harvey for the eighth, hopefully Finnegan for the ninth if it's tied or if uh, they're up. And instead, because Law couldn't get through that inning, now you're calling on Weems earlier. He finishes the sixth, but now you want to bring him back for the seventh because you don't want to waste him like that. But now he can't get through the seventh. And you've got the heart of the lineup coming up. So you want your best reliever to face them. So now that's Hunter Harvey. So Harvey finishes the seventh. But, well, we still have two innings to go, so we better put him back out there for another one. Now he goes in the eighth. He can't complete that inning. He, you know, At that point, the pitch count for him got up to 37, which is really high for him. And so now you got to replace him again. You bring in the new Barnes and Jacob to finish the eighth. And then rather than just have him come back for the ninth, which I thought you could have made the case for, Instead, you bring in Matt Barnes, who just gives up that absolute moonshot to Otani. So it starts with the first guy in. If he does his job, completes the inning, I think everything else sets up well after that. But the moment one thing goes wrong, it's now putting extra on all these others. And, you know, you had a bunch of mid-inning pitching changes. And ideally, you don't want to have to do that as a manager. Do you expect them to be without a lefty in the bullpen for a while? I think at least until Robert Garcia comes back. Now, the thinking behind why they made this move, Jacob Barnes had a great spring, had a good chance to make the team and just kind of was a victim of a numbers game and didn't make it. Then dominates a triple A to start the year. It's one hit and two walks in eight innings to start the year, a triple A. So he's clearly the best available reliever. And the two lefties they have there, Joe Lasorsa and Richard Blyer, neither one of them has pitched that well. So are you going to call up a less effective lefty just so you have a lefty in the bullpen? Or are you going to call up the guy who was the best one and had the really good spring? So I understand why they make that move. It had more to do with that, I think, than anything else. But we know it can come back to haunt you. You don't have a lefty to call upon when you're facing guys like Otani, Freeman, and others that they're going to face. It's a problem, and it's not really a great recipe for success unless you have some lights-out righties who are extremely effective, no matter if they're facing righties or lefties. Tim Shover is here to tell you about game time. This summer at Jiffy Lube Live, acts include Neil Young, Hank Williams Jr., and Chris Stapleton. If you're interested in finding tickets to any of these shows, make sure to check out the Game Time app. Game Time is the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. See the view from your seat before you buy, so you know exactly what to expect. When you arrive, take the guess we're going to buy tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code NATSCHAT for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code NATSCHAT for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences so the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Base is loaded. Again, they go the pitch. Swing and a miss. He struck him out with a high slider. About belt high, and the game is over. Phillips and the Dodgers hold on for the win in the opening game of the series. Well, a lefty pitcher who the Nats do have, and he is in their rotation, at least for now, is Patrick Corbin. 
And he, on Tuesday evening, did well. I give him credit. Five and a third scoreless innings. He gave up just three hits, which were a double and two singles. He did issue three walks. He did record just three strikeouts. 86 pitches, 50 strikes versus 36 balls. We have seen Davey try to push it with Corbin. We really did not see that in this game. Although, Davey did allow Corbin to face the top three batters in the Dodgers lineup for a third time. So I suppose you could make the case that Davey did push it a little bit with Corbin. Uh, He got pulled from the game after facing the Dodgers number three batter, Freddie Freeman, for a third time. But look, Corbin came into this game with an ERA of 8.06 over four starts in this regular season. If you are Davey Martinez, you take those five and a third scoreless innings with open arms, you hug them tightly, and you run away. You get the heck out of there with that kind of an outing from Corbin. Yeah, and let's be clear. I mean, there was traffic on the bases most of the time he was in this game. This was not a real smooth, clean, blow him away, five and a third scoreless. You know, he was up in the 80s by the time he got to the sixth inning. But that's fine. Again, we're grading on a curve here. And if you're Patrick Corbin against that lineup, facing them for the second time in a week, that was fantastic. He did everything possible, made the pitches when he had to, and had nothing but zeros on the board. So I don't have an issue with him getting pulled when he did. It seems like fans get furious when Davey leaves Patrick Corbin in in the sixth, seventh innings to face hitters a third time and ends up getting rocked for it. And then now there were fans complaining that he was pulled when reaching that spot because the relievers who followed didn't do their job. At some point, you got to trust the guys behind him to get the job done. And if Patrick Corbin is pitching like 2019 Patrick Corbin, yeah, you let him keep going. But he has not to this point done anything like that. And so you got through Freddie Freeman the third time and you're in the sixth inning of a one nothing game. I have no problem. You make that move. You thank Patrick Corbin for a great job. And now you just hope your bullpen can hold on the rest of the way. I mentioned Jake Alou getting DFA'd. So if you have not been following Jake Alou, that news may have caught you by surprise. I mean, Jake Alou a year ago at this time was viewed as a potential piece of the rebuild, not so much as a starter, but as a guy who could maybe be a real help for this team as a utility guy, a guy who had done well at times in the minor leagues. Alou this season, unfortunately, had not been doing well. AAA Rochester OPS of just 537. Now, look, he could still stay in the organization. But were you at all surprised that the Dads DFA'd Jake Alou on Tuesday? Not especially. uh, They had to make some kind of move. They had to clear a roster spot on the 40-man. And look, it was a great story. A lot of people have a lot of respect for Jake Alou, who physically doesn't, you know, look like a big imposing prospect, was a late round pick, who just hit his way through the minors and forced the issue last year for them to call him up. Once he was up here, had a few moments, but didn't do a whole lot. And the problem is he's a utility guy, but not really known as a great defender. He can play a bunch of positions, but he's not Ildemaro Vargas in terms of defensive ability out there. So if your one real tool to stay in the big leagues is your hit tool, and you haven't really shown that, and then you didn't show it when you went back to AAA to start the year, given all the other prospects they have coming up through the pipeline, you could see how someone like that gets lost in the shuffle and ends up the odd man out. Now, hopefully he stays in the organization. You know, we've seen it before. It doesn't mean that that's the end of the road, that you can't come back at some point. But I think Jake Alou kind of maximized what he could be. And they knew that and they knew who else they have coming up through the pipeline. And so you get to a point that you say, well, we have to start clearing 40-man spots. I think there are going to be more moves like this. If they call up James Wood, there's a move they have to make. Eventually, you call up Dylan Cruz and Brady House. These are 40-man roster moves they're going to have to make. So there are some decisions that they're going to have to decide to cut ties with players who have been in the big leagues with them the last few years. But ultimately, you have to be realistic about this and say, these guys were stop gaps. These were the kind of players who reached the big leagues when you are in the early to mid stages of a rebuild. Once you get to the final stages, you're calling up the real prospects who you think are going to be a part of this for the long term. All right. Pre-game updates on k Ruiz and Josiah Gray. k Ruiz went out on his rehab assignment with Harrisburg. He caught seven innings. On Tuesday night, went one for four at the plate. I think he's going to be there again on Wednesday, maybe take Thursday off. And I I would expect him back off the IL come Friday in Miami. So that's all good news there. And Josiah Gray has been throwing off flat ground, 75 feet. That's a really good sign. He's only two weeks removed from being placed on the IL uh, with his forearm strain. And what's going to be interesting here is a lot of times with a pitcher on the IL, 
you say, well, he's just thrown off flat ground. We've well, got a long way to go. You got to slow play that up, go to long toss. Then you start throwing off a mound. Then you face live hitters, go on a rehab assignment. It can be a very long and tedious process. But I think because it's been such a short amount of time, only two weeks, and he had his full spring training and built up, you know, was starting the season on time. I think they may be able to speed that up somewhat and not feel like they have to treat him like somebody who's starting over from scratch. So that's good that he's able to do this already because number one, it means the injury wasn't all that serious. But number two, I think it also means that the rehab process could be shorter and we're not talking about weeks and weeks of him slowly ramping up to the point that he's ready to return. Game two for the Nats against the Dodgers Wednesday evening at 645. Jake Irvin will be the Nats starting pitcher. Going to be very interesting to see how Irvin does. As you may recall, it was the previous Wednesday, April 17th, that Irvin was terrific in a 2-0 Nats win at the Dodgers. Six scoreless innings. Irvin in that game, 73 pitches, 54 strikes versus just 19 balls. If he has a second consecutive strong outing against the mighty Dodgers, boy, is that going to say a lot about where Jake Irvin is at. And uh, man, would that be quite the confidence boost for Jake Irvin? I am really interested in these next two games, far more than the first game of the series. I want to see, like you just said, how does Jake Irvin face the same lineup the second straight time? Can he have success? Does he change anything up? Does he go about it the same way? And then I'm also really excited to see Mackenzie Gore in the finale on Thursday. He didn't pitch at Dodger Stadium last week. It didn't line up for him. I want to see Mackenzie Gore at his peak facing Betts, Otani, Freeman, and let's see how that goes. There have not been many times here in recent years that we've been excited for a Nats pitcher to face a big-time lineup. This is going to be up there with some of the better ones we've had in a while. I really want to see how he handles that assignment. Yeah, and Gore is coming off a rough outing uh, this past Friday evening in the 5-3 loss to the Houston Astros at Nationals Park. And perhaps adding to the excitement, maybe, possibly, the Major League regular season debut of James Wood. We shall see. You can hit us up on X at Nats underscore chat. You can email the show NatsChatPodcast at gmail.com. You can find us on YouTube. Just search Nats Chat. We also invite you to check out our website, NatsChatPodcast.com, at which you can purchase a Nats Chat Podcast t-shirt. All Nationals radio highlights on Nats Chat are courtesy of 106.7 The Fan. For Mark Zuckerman, I'm Al Galdi. We thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you next time on the Nats Chat Podcast. And Jake Alou will lead off against him. Left-hander against the left-handed pitcher. Swing and a drive in the air to deep right. This is way back. This is going, going, and it is gone. Goodbye. Bang. Zoom goes Jake Alou. Plato's Closet in West Ashley and North Charleston are springing up cash. Just sell us your gently used warm weather styles like tees, shorts, sandals, and more. We're paying cash on the spot for gently used spring styles for guys and girls. Support sustainable fashion. This spring, do your thing and recycle the spring-inspired clothes, shoes, and accessories that are just hanging in your closet for cash on the spot. Let your spring clothes bloom into cash at Plato's Closet. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue.